Today, we're gonna to talk about vanilla in perfumery. So in this video, I'm gonna explain a little bit about vanilla as a plant and how it's extracted for use in perfumery. Then we're gonna go and actually smell some real vanilla absolute. And then I'm also gonna cover some vanilla synthetics and explain a little bit about the differences between them and how you can go and use them in your perfumes. So if you're interested in learning about vanilla and its use in perfumery, then definitely watch to the end of this video. This video is sponsored by Luxeterra, my online store where you can find all of the essential equipment for perfumery. Only good quality and good value for money products make the cut and I use almost all of the products myself when making perfumes for my brand. To browse the full range of products, visit www.lux-terra.co.uk or click the link in the description. So then, vanilla, what actually is it? Well, you'll be interested to know that vanilla, rather than some kind of regular plant, is actually a climbing vine, which means it climbs up other things. And I was really interested to find out that apparently it doesn't actually take its nutrients directly from the soil, but rather it actually just kind of absorbs them from the air. So that's pretty cool, right? Now, vanilla is native to Mexico and Central America. However, centuries ago, it was taken to other places and among them were the Reunion Islands and Madagascar and other places in the Indian Ocean. And today, most vanilla in the world is actually produced in those locations. And specifically, vanilla from that area now is called Bourbon Vanilla. So if you heard the term uh, Bourbon Vanilla come up anywhere, then it just means it's grown in that kind of Indian Ocean area. The other thing about vanilla that not many people know is that the pods that grow, you know, those uh, dark brown vanilla pods that you see, well, they're not actually like that on the plant. On the plant, there are actually kind of these green or fresh green pods, and you actually have to harvest those and go and cure them or dry them for about three months before they kind of turn that dark brown color. And those green pods on the tree, well, they don't actually smell of anything yet. It's only once the curing process has happened that the aromatic compounds develop inside. Now, as you can already see with vanilla, not everything is quite so simple. And that also is true for the extraction. With vanilla, you can't simply make an essential oil that is to distill it like a lot of other plants. So you have to use other extraction techniques instead. Now, one method is you can make an absolute, but even with the absolute, it's just not that simple. You have to employ really specialist uh, techniques compared to other absolutes, and that's just a technicality of the vanilla. But you do end up getting an absolute out of it, and that is probably the most concentrated form of vanilla that you can get for perfumery. Conversely, you can also tincture it, and this is actually something you can do at home. So the classic recipe as such for a vanilla tincture is you take take 1,000 grams, so that's a kilogram of 95%, or that's 190 proof ethyl alcohol. So that's just regular ethanol uh, alcohol. Make sure you do a food grade or cosmetics grade if you're using it for perfumery, or if you wanted to use it in a, a flavoring, you'd wanna make sure you're using food grade. So you take a kilogram of this alcohol, and then you add to that 125 grams of chopped vanilla pods, or you can grind them up instead if you want. You need to make sure that they're dry before doing this. Then you leave that to sit for two weeks, and that will kind of allow the alcohol to absorb all of the aromatic compounds out of the vanilla pod. And then all you have to do is just filter out the pods and you're left with your vanilla tincture. So you can actually go and use that directly in your perfumes. Now, another thing is very similar actually, is called a vanilla infusion. And that's pretty much the same. You put in your uh, chopped vanilla pods with your alcohol, but this time you do what's called refluxing it instead. And what that really means is you just kind of boil the pods in the alcohol. Obviously you need to do that in a kind of proper scientific lab and know what you're doing. Otherwise it's gonna be a little bit dangerous. So yeah, you've got a vanilla infusion, a vanilla tincture, and a vanilla absolute. Now you can make other extracts or other products from vanilla, but those are the three that we're interested in in this video. An important and probably the most famous molecule in vanilla is something called vanillin, and we'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute. But the thing about vanillin is that it's way, way cheaper than using actual vanilla extracts. And for that reason, most commercial flavorings that use vanilla are actually just vanillin or vanillin dressed up with something else. And because of that, most people don't actually know the true smell of real vanilla. They just know the smell of synthetic vanillin thinking that is the smell of vanilla. Anyway, I've got some vanilla raw materials right here, so I'll smell them and let you guys know what they smell like. 
So firstly, I've got some vanilla absolute. And this stuff, by the way, is really, really expensive. The website which I got it from, for the pure vanilla absolute, it was $45 per gram. So that's just one tiny little gram of vanilla absolute. $45, it's expensive stuff. Just a quick heads up, all the things that I'm gonna smell in this video are gonna be diluted to 10% in alcohol, um, and that's just because it's easier to evaluate things for perfumery when they're already diluted. So the Vanilla Absolute at 10%. Now this stuff, um, firstly it smells really nice, it just smells really, really amazing. Um, and one thing that is quite striking is the difference it has from that kind of standard vanilla flavoring that you expect. Because when you get something like a vanilla ice cream or, you know, vanilla air freshener or this or that, um, you smell this kind of sweet vanilla smell, which is what you would expect. But when you smell this vanilla absolute, it's actually not that sweet at all. And I would say the overall smell of it is it's actually very woody and it's a really, really kind of dry, woody smell, but it's got this kind of deep, dark, complex undertones. It's got loads of different nuances to it. I think it's really, really nice smelling. Um, it makes me kind of think that I'm like on some kind of tropical beach with like loads of um, kind of driftwood baking in the sun or something like that. But yeah, it's it's really, really nice, this raw material, and you do get little hints of sweetness in it, but it's very, very refined, it's very elegant. It's also quite powerful as well, it's pretty strong. So next we're gonna look at the Vanilla Infusion, which I've got here, and this one is actually made by Fimonich, and it's a new uh, version or a new kind of process, I guess manufacturing process of this raw material that they've released. Um, so before they were using it in-house, and now they've released it so you can actually go and buy some. Um, so this vanilla infusion, now when I go and smell this right after the vanilla absolute, I'm not going to lie, I barely smell anything. And I think that's because the vanilla absolute is just so much stronger and more concentrated than the vanilla infusion. What I will go and say though is thinking back to earlier when I smelled this without having already um, bombarded my nose, so back when my nose was fresh enough to actually smell it, you do definitely smell it, it is just a lot weaker. And with the vanilla infusion, you do still get a lot of those kind of nice complex woody notes of the absolute. And the reason that that's important to note is because you don't get that when you smell the synthetic vanilla aroma chemicals. Another thing about the infusion is that it's also a lot less expensive than the absolute. So even though it's less strong, um, I think this thing cost me about one pound per gram. So it's similar to one dollar per gram. So that's already about 45 times cheaper than the absolute. So you gotta think that even though the Absolute is a lot more of a kind of star raw material and it's a lot like stronger, it's probably nicer as well. You can't necessarily afford to actually go and use the Absolute probably in most perfumery projects. Like if you wanted to go and buy this vanilla Absolute and use it in a perfume, you could probably only really afford to do that if a, you're just making a one-off really special perfume, or B, if you're trying to make any kind of reasonable amount of perfumes, to get enough of this to make your perfumes out of is gonna be so, so expensive that you're really gonna to have to be like selling the perfumes for a really high price. So it's gonna be the real like top end of the luxury spectrum essentially in order to go and use this. And that again is a big reason why the vanilla aroma chemicals are so important because most projects just don't have the budget to use the Vanilla Absolute. As nice as it is, it's just not possible in most situations. So next, let's talk a little bit about those aroma chemicals. So what I've got here is some vanillin, and that's that same really famous aroma chemical which I talked to you about just a little bit before. So if I go and smell this, when you smell vanillin, you instantly think vanilla, it smells of vanilla. And probably a lot more so if you hadn't just gone and smelled the real vanilla absolute. And the smell of vanilla, I would say, is pretty much what you'd expect when someone says, um, I want a vanilla syrup or a vanilla, you know, a vanilla flavoring, ice cream, vanilla flavored sweets, whatever it is, this is pretty much exactly the smell that you would think of. And yeah, it smells nice. Just because it's not the absolute smell, it doesn't mean it's not nice. It's really, really nice. It's this kind of sweet, creamy, um, well, all I can say is vanilla-like kind of smell. And you do get slight hints of it, I think, in the absolute, but it's really only very subtle. Yet this on its own is very powerful, and it's just this kind of pure, creamy, sweet smell.
So obviously this is why then vanillin is so attractive because it just smells really nice and it's really, really cheap. So if you go and buy vanillin, you can easily get it for something like 10p, so that's, um, you know, like 0.1 of a dollar kind of thing per gram. And that's even if you're buying it in smaller quantities, if you're in the industry and you're buying it in massive industrial quantities, it's probably even a lot cheaper than that. So this stuff is really, really economical to use. However, not only is it really cheap, you also don't need a lot of it. And that's because vanillin is, I find, really, really strong. When I'm making perfumes with vanillin in, I find anything more than 0.5% of the final perfume being vanillin, then suddenly the whole thing is sickly sweet. So I find it's good just to use a trace amount. So this is almost um, pretty ideal because it smells really nice, it's really cheap, and it's quite strong, which means you don't even need to use much of it. Then in addition to that, it's also a base note, so it lasts a really long time. So all in all, vanillin is pretty much a star raw material, and it's also one that I would really recommend as one of your first or most essential raw materials to any perfumer's palette. It's also one of the oldest synthetic raw materials. It was actually industrialized, so the, um, the reaction was discovered to make it on an industrial scale, economically or cheaply. That was discovered back in 1876, by someone called Ferdinand Thiemann. And it was only three years later in 1889 that it was used in the perfume Jiki by Guerlain. And that is heralded as the first modern perfume due to its use of synthetics such as vanillin. Anyway, that's enough on vanillin. Now I wanna to talk to you a bit about some of its derivatives. So what I mean by that is very similar molecules, both in structure, but also their smell. And I, yeah, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the different, let's call them variants of the vanillin molecule that we can also go and use in perfumery. So I will be showing you the molecular structures for these molecules. And that's just because I think it's very interesting how you can see uh, visually in the picture of it that with just a very slight change to the molecule, you actually get a similar smell, but also a notably different smell. So I'll go through all these molecules and I'll quickly mention the change, but Mainly, I'll explain how they actually go and smell. Firstly, we've got that vanillin. And if you have a look at this molecule, you can see that we've got a methoxy group. Now, if you go and switch that to an ethoxy group, that's essentially adding one more uh, carbon with three hydrogens on the end of it, well, what you get is something called ethyl vanillin. So essentially, there's one tiny change on the molecule. Now, if I go and smell ethyl vanillin right after vanillin, well, it's very interesting because firstly, the actual smell of the two molecules is pretty similar. So ethyl vanillin has this sweet, creamy vanilla smell, just like the vanillin. But the difference between the ethyl vanillin is, well, firstly, it smells a little bit stronger and you notice that straight away. But secondly, in my opinion, ethyl vanillin is a lot creamier. It's more, um, I would say it's closer to things like white chocolate. It's just got this really nice kind of marshmallow creamy kind of smell. Whereas the actual vanillin is slightly, um, let's say a bit more back towards the original vanilla absolute. It's not quite as creamy. It's just not quite as sweet. And that's called the vanilla in the baseline because we'll be using that as well for the other things. But yeah, this ethyl vanillin is strong and it's sweet. And it's also a base note just like vanillin, so it lasts a long time. And because it's stronger, you don't necessarily have to use as much. Though I find personally that if I'm gonna pick between ethyl vanillin and vanillin, I would normally do it more based on the actual smell because if I want that creamier smell, then I'd probably go for the ethyl vanillin. If I want something that's a bit more kind of traditional vanilla, then I'll probably go for the vanilla. Now, another thing is people do say that ethyl vanillin is a bit less prone to discoloration, and that's because vanillin and also ethyl vanillin, they do tend to discolor. So that means if you have a clear perfume, then over time they can start to uh, become a little bit brown, which obviously not everyone wants. So there's just something to note there. Apparently, if you use ethyl vanillin, that happens a little bit less so. Next then, I wanna talk about guaiacol. Now, if you go and look at the molecule, you've just got this kind of methyl group with an aldehyde on the end or this little part of the structure. It's just been completely cut off and removed. And apart from that, the molecule is the same. So what does guaiacol smell like? Well, the first thing is it's extremely strong, probably the strongest molecule out of all the ones I've got here. Um, you can smell it from quite a distance, even diluted down. 
Now the guaiacol to me smells like a mixture between a kind of smoky, slightly leathery molecule and vanillin. So it's this very interesting combination of like a dark smoky vanilla that's very, very strong. So I haven't really used this much myself, but where I would really imagine that this would be useful is maybe in trace amounts if you want to make the actual vanillin smell a bit more like the absolute, because remember the vanilla absolute's got these dark kind of smoky woody facets to it. I would imagine it'd be useful in that. Or if you're working on a particularly kind of smoky leathery kind of fragrance and you want to add a sweet element to it, I imagine that it would be useful instead of maybe the pure vanillin to have something that's a bit more in the right direction already. Next then we have something called isobutavan, or another name for it is vanillin isobutyrate, and that's because we've taken vanillin and made an ester with it. So if you go and watch my video on esters, then you can go and understand that a little bit better. But essentially esters are usually more fruity smelling things and it's a bit more unusual to go and actually make an ester with vanillin but it's chemistry so there's no reason why we can't do it. So that's what isobutavan is. And isobutavan, so it's a lot more subtle I find than things like the ethyl vanillin and the guaiacol. But what it is, is this kind of sweet, creamy smell. I still think it's more leaning on the side of the ethyl vanillin in that kind of um, very kind of like milky creaminess. But to me, isobutavan has really got this kind of like white chocolate uh, smell. If you've gone and tasted like a milky bar or some white chocolate, I think it's got this distinctive uh, kind of taste that's very similar to how this smells. And I also find when you just go and dip your scent strip into isobutavan to begin with, I personally find there's just a slight kind of, um, maybe like fruity facet to it, but I find that for some reason seems to go along with the ethanol. So I'm not quite too sure what's happening there, but I do find it quite interesting, especially because that's an ester and often esters are just more fruity smells. Next then we have something else, which I also think fits in the vanilla category, and that is methyl deantilis. So this one is very interesting because to me, this molecule really smells like a crossover between vanillin and eugenol. And if you don't know what eugenol is, well, it's pretty much the molecule which is responsible for the smell of cloves. So it's that very warm, woody, spicy kind of clove-like smell. So to me, methyl deantilis smells like really kind of sweet vanilla cloves, which I find very interesting. And if you look at the structures, um, the structure of methyl deantilis is also similar to vanillin, but it's also similar to eugenol as well to some degree. So again, I find that kind of interesting. But when you go and smell it, yeah, it smells like kind of a sweet, spicy, uh, kind of clove-like, maybe a little bit Christmassy leaning smell. I've also heard people say that it can be used in carnations, which is a flower, which when you go smell it, it also has those kind of spicy eugenolic notes. I've never tried to make a carnation accord myself, so I'm not sure how it would go, but I definitely can imagine you getting something like that using this note. So yeah, that's the methyl deantilis. This one, it's a little bit more expensive, but I do like it a lot. I think it's worth getting, um, especially if you like those kind of sweet, spicy kind of smells. The final one that I've got here is something called Vera Traldehyde, and this is essentially a methylated version of vanillin, i.e. it's had like a methyl group put on the end of it. So this one, this one is a lot more subtle, I find, than the others. It's very kind of, um, to smell it, you really have to look for it. It's a lot more low-key, um, but, but it is there and you can smell it. And to me, this one smells like vanillin, but this time with a cherry aspect to it. So it's close to something like a heliotropin kind of smell or like a cherry kind of smell. And I find this one is really nice because it is very subtle and it can kind of sit there in the base note of your fragrance and it can add this kind of slight sweet cherry touch. But I find that it also does it in a kind of subtle way, which usually just kind of sits well with other things. So yeah, I think this one's quite nice. Um, I definitely recommend you get some veratraldehyde unless you hate kind of sweet cherry smells just because I think it's very versatile and you can use it in a lot of different uh, places. This is also one of the raw materials in the base note of the perfume which won my perfumery competition 
I did a few months back. So if you're interested in a way of using Veritralahide, then definitely go check out that video. I'll put a link in the description and you can look at the formula for the base note of that perfume. And I think that base note was really, really nice and it made quite heavy use of the Veritralahide. Well, that's it. Six vanilla aroma chemicals and two vanilla naturals. Now, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned something either just about vanilla and how it's extracted and harvested, or maybe just how to use these things in your perfumes. If you have other vanilla aroma chemicals that I didn't cover, then please do let me know um, because there are some that I also don't have myself and I'd definitely be interested to learn about them in case I actually want to go and get them because, you know, you can never have enough vanilla synthetics. Apart from that, remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like these and I'll see you next time with a new video about something else to do with perfumery next week.